really interesting way of spreading their spores, and that is that they digest themselves and so, turn into a soup of spores. Should I send you a picture? Because I have a vial of soup. Okay, that. that's gonna start smelling real bad real fast. <laughs> uh, it, 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 it's it's sealed. Like um, I used. Don't, don't open it. Oh, okay. So should I send that as oh, my crap. picture for the spore yeah, print? Yeah, that that'll work. Um, but um, if you want to do more spore prints and have them turn out better, put like a couple drops of water on the top of the cap of your mushroom. And then make sure you put a like a cup or a mug over it overnight. That's what I did. I uh, and then and they still dried out. Yeah, and so for the second one, which turned out only slightly better because I had a couple extras, mm -hmm. um, I put a little bit of water, like I rinsed the cup out for some extra moisture, okay. and that gave me just a very very faint um, print, but. Maybe it's just um, super were you doing this on foil or paper? Paper. All right. Foil is a little bit better. Um, you get less of a dry out effect, and it's easier to see the spores. Because if it's light colored spores, which a lot of them are, then doing it on white paper is basically impossible to see. Okay. Uh, one thing I used to do was like take white paper and make a little circle and sharpie over half of it so you've got like half black half light and i would put my mushroom cap over that kind of center area so no matter what the color spores were they they'd turn up on at least half of it and i could see them so that's maybe a trick you can try um, for really light colored spores but foil, foil definitely works better um, and if you're trying to actively culture mushrooms from spores Doing it on foil lets you sterilize the foil first, which is super okay. handy. So you can just wipe it down with, you know, rubbing alcohol, let it dry, and then put your mushroom right on there, and it keeps it a lot cleaner. When you say foil, you mean aluminum foil, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Hey, Dr. Zong, can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, finally. Sorry, my mic wasn't working there for a second. Okay. Um, I'm wondering, um, do we have a reading quiz this week because of the or do we not because of the test? You do. Okay, just want to make sure. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, with the spore print, do we have instructions anywhere? I'm so sorry, I think I missed that. I think it was the day when I was having internet problems. Oh, yeah, let me share my screen. Because I got my species as well. and. Okay. So, my screen showing up? Yes, yeah. All right. So, if you go up here to the quick links. Oh, sweet. Hillbilly Mycology. And then go down to protocols. We've got spore prints right here. Perfect. Okay. Awesome. So Great. There's a few. Probably the most cogent one is this first one, how to make a spore print. And then... If you want to get into what you're seeing, because I mean, the next step is, oh, I've got a spore print. Right. Now I want to look at the spores. You got a little microscope, so pop some onto a slide and take a look at them. Okay. Um, honestly, they're one of the best ways to actually identify a mushroom morphologically right. is the spores. Most people don't get there, and guidebooks don't really talk about it, but that's kind of how to do it. And so I've got a database of spore traits also if you're interested in trying that out yeah awesome okay thank you so much Dr. Uh -huh. all right um i don't know what exactly we're going over today but at some point can you do like an example um of how to use the identification chart because I've tried doing it twice, but I'm kind of unsure off of these pictures for stuff like the edges or uh -huh. um, like right. attachment of gills, that sort of thing. Um, well, we actually are going to be covering that today. 
Um, so today it's, it's going to be a fairly short lesson, but it's just kind of like getting to know mushrooms a little bit better. Um, kind of like looking at the physiology of fungi, kind of where they live, how they live, and then getting to know how mushrooms grow and what the different traits are and some names for them. So, yes, we will go through that. Um, I have one question on that. Is it okay? I mean, if you find them in different areas, like if you possibly have the same species or who knows? I mean, I want five different mushrooms for the assignment. Okay. The city of my seats. Yeah. Along with that, um, I was wondering as so on the uh, on the. Week five here, it says that that um, the five collections of mushrooms are due next week. Is that? Yeah, you know, I, I, I wrote that before I realized what the semester was really going to be like, and so that's fine. I, I just it's probably good to get it done now because of the weather change, right? Yeah, and we just got that rain. Yeah, and even a little sprinkling today here in Pleasant Grove. So like now it's probably a decent time to go looking if you've been not having luck so far here in okay. the next like week to three weeks is the only real mushroom season of Utah. Yeah. All right. I'll try to get done. Doctors, and I guess I do have a question similar okay. to what I was asked earlier. So I end up finding four. I, I thought there were four different species. They look very different, but they were relatively within the same area. I mean, I'm talking about like maybe 20 feet square, 20 square feet area. Mm -hmm. That's fine. I mean, they look completely different. Some are like smaller, yellow, some are purple. <laughs> so they look very different. Yeah, if they look very different, there's a good okay. chance they are then different. Probably yeah. they're different. Okay, great. Just because yeah. I was, I was all concerned. I was like, I don't know if there are, you know, different stages of maturity. Some of them clearly look it's possible, different, but, but then when I looked underneath, I'm pretty certain they're the same one. But I found enough different ones that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. Doctor Zahn. Yes. So is the reading quiz this week only on, um, the paper? Yeah. Um, okay. You're done reading the textbook. Bless. Yay. All of you did real good. You read a lot of that textbook. Um, the rest of it is if you want to go on and study more mycology, you've got that as a resource. Um, but now, yeah, we're transitioning into papers. Um, for the remainder of the class. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, let us take a quick look at fungal physiology and then kind of just get to know what these mushrooms we're collecting are all about, okay? So we're gonna briefly look at nutrition and metabolism um, and then look at like mushroom mechanics, how mushrooms grow and why they can grow so fast. It's kind of freaky. Um, look at active dispersal with a focus on that Buller drop mechanism that we briefly talked about last time and then covered a little bit about how to identify mushrooms, what those weird terms are, how to tell if a margin is entire or crespi crespitate or whatever. Yeah, okay. So, um, fungi are found like all over the place and that's because they're so good at making secondary compounds. Okay, so Fungi have really become kind of the masters of digesting some of Earth's hardest to digest materials. Um, seen down at the bottom here, this is lignin. Uh, this is the molecular structure of lignin. Do you know what lignin is? Anybody? No one? Protein. Protein. It's a major structural component of woody plants. It's one of the big things that differentiates something that's woody to just a regular plant stem. It produces, provides a lot of structure, it's really tough, and it's really, really difficult to digest. Bingo. 20 points for Gryffindor. 
Yes. Um, lignin is the wood of plants. Okay. Paper that we're looking at here, this is mostly cellulose. Okay. But that heartwood, the really tough stuff, um, that's lignin. And so it's a really super abundant molecule on Earth. Um, all these trees make it, these woody plants. Okay. But it's also incredibly difficult to decompose. Um, it's just got all of its little sites protected. It's really hard for any uh, biomolecules to actually get in there and do anything with it. But fungi have been specialists in decomposing lignin for a long, long time now, pretty much ever since lignin has been around. Okay. Um, the upside here is that fungi are masters at making all kinds of digestive enzymes. Um, they can digest lignin. Until recently, we thought they were the only things that can, but there's recent evidence um, just in the past like year or two um, that I've become aware of that some bacteria are capable of very slowly digesting lignin. Um, I don't think the authors of that study were trying to say that bacteria were responsible for like lignin recycling, but just that there is that ability out there. However, without fungi, when a tree dies, it would just be a log in the forest forever and eventually we would have no CO2 in the atmosphere. All plant life would die. Okay. Um, we know about termites eating wood, so they're eating lignin and cellulose, but they can't actually digest it at all. It's fungi in their guts doing that digesting. Okay. Um, so fungi can access a lot of biochemical pathways for getting carbon, right? So I've listed just a few like fair sources of carbon for them. They're, they can get it from cellulose, right? Not many things can do that. Pectin, chitin, starch, um, even proteins. Okay, so they really run the gamut of where they're getting their carbon. Okay, so where they get their carbon kind of relates to what we call a trophic mode. So, trophic modes of fungi are quite varied. Okay, we've got animal pathogens that specialize in animals. Arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. All right, who wants to remind me what those are? Where are they found in our fungal phylogeny? Oh, in the phylogeny. I was going to say where they found in nature. Where are they found in nature? We'll start there. Those are uh, on the roots of plants, right? On and in the roots of plants. Yeah. I guess they were like but I can't remember. Ectomycorrhizal are on the roots of plants, arbuscular are like in. And I just talked over somebody. Who somebody was telling me where arbuscular mycorrhizal were found. I was mycorrhizal. guessing zygomycetes. I just thought I was remembering it from my reading last night, but I can't yep. remember. That's right. They're in the zygos. Okay. Cool. Um, ericoid mycorrhizal. Any guesses on that? Any botanist types? Nobody? Really pretty flowers. People grow them in their offices. They like the tropics. Orchids? Yeah. Fungi that specialize on relationships with orchids and that's the only thing they do they can't live without them and orchids can't live without the fungi so they've got their their own little class foliar endophytes these live with inside the leaves of plants okay we've got lichenicolous fungi that can only grow on lichens and we've got lichenized fungi that are farming green stuff fungi that specialize in eating other fungi we've got plant pathogens and saprotrophs if I was going to divide these into some groups and had to pick three, um, depending on the textbook source or the paper that I found, they kind of divided these up differently. But I went with these three as kind of a reasonable um, compromise, I suppose. You can eat dead stuff, okay? You can need a living host and keep it alive, or you can be something that kills your host and then eats the corpse. 
So the fungi essentially can be all categorized into kind of one of those three categories. Okay. I've got a little link here for the Fun Guild website. So I'm going to go there. All right. Here it is. Let me make this light a little easier to see for you. This is Fun Guild. Um, it's a pretty useful, neat little website. Um, a friend of mine, Nu Wen, was kind of one of the, the founders of this website. He wrote some Python code that tried to parse out where fungi were found, um, what ecological guild they were filling. So, give me a name of a fungus. Saccharomyces uh, cerevisiae. Saccharomyces cerevisiae. I think I spelled that right. Boom, there it is. So you can just search there. And what to tell you? Okay, this is a species level identification. Its trophic mode is saprotroph. So what's it do? It eats dead stuff. Digests, digests dead, dead stuff. stuff. Yeah, it's it's a decomposer. Okay. How confident are we that it's a saprotroph? Probably. Okay. Its growth form is a yeast. We got some traits and notes of which we have nothing, and then a citation. For Wait, the only probable. When it's saying the confidence rating, is that not something where? Is that not actually something we can then? for sure say about uh, one guy? Yeah, well, this is kind of a epistemological argument in science, right? Can you ever say that you're 100% sure of anything? Well, we literally have <laughs> the entire sequence of their genetics that has been sequenced. We know almost all there is that we can know about that. Well, like, isn't it? probable that there are strains of Saccharomyces cerevisiae that exist in the world that we haven't observed and might be weird? I, yes. Yeah, okay, so probable <laughs> is means it... what it means. Um, this is to say that you're never going to have certainty about anything in science. Is it possible for one fungi to have more than one trophic mode? Mm-hmm. And they can switch based on environment. Um, so we've all got candida living on our skin, right? And we'll see this next week. Um, candida exists as a commensal saprotroph most of the time on our skin. But it can switch over and start eating us if we become immunocompromised. Okay. Um, so the the idea of saying probable here is, yeah, we we know an awful lot about this species. There are literally thousands of people who have PhDs in this species and studies genetics um, 52 weeks a year, and we still just say it's probably a saprotroph. Um, this, this gets at something that um, I think even advanced standing science undergrads don't really, haven't really absorbed. Science never proves anything, ever. Science progresses by disproving things. So we can be certain that something isn't the case, but we can't be certain that something is the case. So on the confidence rating, mm -hmm. How high up is probable? Because it doesn't sound that confident, but is that potentially like really high up? Let's just take a look at um, a genus level. Okay. Well, that didn't do it for us. Neocalamastigomycota. Nothing. Dang it. Mucor. Oh, okay. Highly probable that mucor dispersus is a dung saprotroph. Okay. It's not going to go any higher than that. Okay. 
So if you just type in a genus name, this is going to give you a list. Um, show them all. It'll give you a list of all the species that are currently in the database of Fun Guild. Okay. This is a neat little tool. Um, if you're interested in a species and kind of want to see what it does, this is a nice spot to go. It's not like a magic bullet. We don't have every species in this database yet. You know, they're working on adding to it. Um, Anita. Okay. Um, growth form, agaricoid, trait, poisonous. Okay. Death cap. Okay. So if you're interested in a genus, go here to Fun Guild and check it out. Where was I? Okay. Um, the difference between a, a biotroph and necrotroph is kind of one of timing. They both essentially need a living plant or a living host um, in order to survive. Um, one just kills the other, kills the host more slowly, if at all. Okay, so a biotroph needs a living host and may or may not actually damage it necessarily. It could be beneficial. A necrotroph is in there killing it kind of quickly. So the difference... Um, obligate versus unspecialized uh, kills the cells rapidly versus might not even damage them or kills them very slowly okay so nice little table to kind of help you choose between whether something is a biotroph or a necrotroph what is the fungus shown here in this top photo how would you classify its trophic mode zapotroph necrotroph Ooh. Oh wait, oh, because it's on. I would say biotroph. Ooh. It, well, it's is it killing alive? its host. Is it considered alive? I guess. Yes. Yeah, is the strawberry still alive if it's not decomposed? I guess it's it is because it's got anymore. seeds and stuff. So, I don't know. Is it eating the outside layer that's slowly dying, or is it killing <laughs> the outside layer and then eating it? <laughs> Isn't this fun? <laughs> I think it's eating from the outside in, and it's still alive inside. We can make this argument all the time. Um, yeah, this is this is what a mycologist do is they bicker back and forth about this exact sort of thing. You got to get a bit closer into the biochemistry of what's happening. I happen to know that that's a mucor, and it is a saprotroph. It it's eating simple sugars. It doesn't need that strawberry. It'll grow an auger just as easily. And so it does take some experimentation to kind of find out. You can't tell very easily just from looking at something, whether it's a saprotroph, biotroph, or necrotroph. What about the bottom picture? Sorry, I have a question. Does that mean that the strawberry is dead? Well, the sugar isn't alive, and that's all that it's actually eating. Okay. And if I microwaved the strawberry first and then put this fungus on there, it would be just as happy. And the only way I would know that is by microwaving the strawberry and then putting this fungus on it. So Can you answer, is a, is a seed considered alive? Yeah. But it's... I mean, as long as it's viable, but like it's not actually eating the seeds, this particular fungus. So after it would decompose it, the seeds would still remain? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. Um, right, I would up? say biotroph for the lower one. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to go biotroph on that. That's ringworm, right? It's a common fungal parasite of humans. Okay. Um, it does actually need you alive. It needs living skin to grow in okay is it it's, killing the skin that it's actually eating though um some of it's dying off but not really right it's, it's getting inflamed and everything and it's killing some cells but it's not killing the host 
if that makes any difference. So um, in the case so, of the strawberry, the strawberry isn't really can the strawberry isn't the host, or I guess the strawberry is the host, but it's only eating the sugars. Yeah, the strawberry is like actually just part of the host. The strawberry plant, right, can get this growing on it. This doesn't kill the plant. It's just eating part of the strawberry plant, the sugars in the fruit. So would it be as, um, so would it have to actually be getting like into the roots of an actual strawberry plant to be considered a biotroph or an ectotroph? The roots or the leaves or the stem, yeah. So it's not always easy to like glance at a fungus and be able to classify what its trophic mode is, um, which is why that database is still limited. Um, we don't immediately know all these things. It takes experimentation. We have to get this thing in culture and see what it can and can't do um, under different environmental circumstances. Okay. So let's take a look at saprotrophs. Um, By far, most fungi fall into this category. They're recyclers, decomposers. They're taking dead material, pulling carbon, useful carbon from it, okay, and changing it in the process. If you go out on a hike, you're bound to, to find chunks of wood that look like this next to fallen trees. Surely you've seen that before. Um, this is white rot, where it actually dissolves the lignin and then brown rot leaves the lignin behind. So what we're looking at here is just kind of like the lignin skeleton of a tree when all the cellulose has been stripped away by fungi, rotted away, okay? And here you get like a much stringier, flakier decomposition. It dissolves the lignin first before other fungi come in to like feast on the cellulose that was left behind. Okay. So you're looking at the recycling of carbon, right? It got trapped by a tree out of the air. And the, these fungi are the only things really out there in any ecological sense, putting it back into the atmosphere for us. Okay. Hey, Dr. Zahn. Yeah. Does, does, do different kinds of fungi play a role in like petrified forests and stuff like that? Or is that just a completely different physical phenomenon? That's a different process. So that's um, like, um, high solute level minerals. Mineralization. Yeah. Oh, okay. Washing over. That's the like kind of, back of replacing. A yeah, it's like fossils. Mm -hmm. So, does that still happen today? Like, because I feel like fungi are everywhere. There's still areas where like wood gets petrified, or is that just kind of something that happened before? Fungi were everywhere back then too, um, but imagine like a volcanic eruption and something gets blanketed by ash and then water seeping through it. And it's like super, super high in minerals because it's filtering through this toxic ash. Fungi aren't going to be surviving. The trees are all dead and, and the minerals are what replaces it. So you get fossilization when stuff doesn't get broken down for whatever reason. Um, deep burial is one reason. Um, being buried in an anoxic environment. Have you heard of like the bog mummies in Scotland? They're awesome, yes. Okay, well, we just have to stop for a second then and look at a photo of bog mummy. It's like the most preserved ever, right? Yeah. Um, is this not psychotic, right? These are thousands of years old. They sunk into the bogs. It's anoxic, pretty acidic there, and so they're just preserved. They're not broken down. Bacteria can't work away at them. Fungi can't work away at them because they don't have the environmental conditions to survive there. Um, so these are actually starting to pop up more and more as permafrost thaws in the northern latitudes. Also, um, we just found essentially like a bog mummy frozen version of a cave bear in Russia. Did you hear about that? No, that sounds totally, awesome. totally un decomposed cave bear intact with like soft tissue and fur and everything. Um, so if a fungus, this, 
If this Fungi is... were to interact with it now, would it be able to decompose it? Totally. Yeah. Um, this is a major problem with permafrost thawing, not just like climate change is going to kill lots of people and change our agriculture forever, but uh, it's we've also got really old diseases, like 40,000 years old in essentially like frozen deer carcasses that are now coming back out and reviving. So new strains of anthrax have been discovered in deer carcasses that are 30,000 years old in Siberia. Woo! Yeah. Neat. 2020 Great. is just getting better and better. There's fire tornadoes in California and ancient anthrax coming to kill us. And maybe the bog mummies will just come alive and finish the job before we kill ourselves. I think I saw that on uh, Scooby-Doo. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's real life now. Right. So, yeah, that was quite a digression. Um, so, yeah, it's it's not fossilization. Um, it's fossils happen when fungi can't get to it. Okay. Most fungi are aerobic, or at best, facultative anaerobes, like Saccharomyces, right? Uh, but there are some fungi that are strict anaerobes. We don't hear much about them because they're really weird and they kind of fall in their own special branch of the chytrid clade. But here's a picture of them, top left here. They're real tiny microscopic chytrid-like little things and they only live essentially in the guts of rumen animals, so like cows and deer and stuff. Okay. They're what's a major component of what's breaking down the grass so a cow can actually eat it. No animal on earth can actually digest cellulose and, and get carbon from it. So that's what the rumen is all about. It's an anaerobic chamber where the cow can chew up some grass, stick it in there, let it ferment with these fungi, break it down to get simple sugars, then they hook it back up and suck it down into their real stomach. Okay. Um, but this is just to show you like some of the crazy places that fungi have found a way to make livings like on sand, um, dung fungi, always beautiful, fallen leaves, these beautiful like little pinwheel looking fungi, marasmius. Okay. So those are saprotrophs. And then we've got our biotrophs. These can't grow without a living host. On the left, I'm showing you ectomycorrhiza and arbuscular mycorrhiza. We have not really seen ectomycorrhizal or ECM fungi yet. We'll talk about them when we talk about like fungal plant symbioses um, and also a bit more about the arbuscular. But just to show you that there's, these don't actually go inside of the plant cells. At best, they go between the plant cells, whereas the arbuscular actually are growing into the plant cell. Okay, we got a photo here in the center at the top. What kind of fungus is it? That would be on the outside, right? Ecto. Okay. But are you looking for like saprotroph or biotroph? It's definitely a biotroph because this is the biotroph yeah. slide. Um, can you give me a group name for that fungus or a name for the structures we're seeing? One of the rusts. Yeah, I'm going with rust. Cool. So that's the underside of a leaf. It's rust colored. What's the name for that structure in a rust fungus? Oh, is this the one that there's also some on the bottom side of the leaf? Yeah, and we're looking at the bottom side of the leaf right now. Oh, we is are. Is it the uridium? It's the other one. I remember learning about it. Hold on one second. On, let me look up the term. <laughs> uh-huh. Is the ECM? Yeah, those are ECA that we're seeing there. Rust fungi are all biotrophs. They need a living host. And even though they actually can damage their host, right, that's hurting the leaf. Um, they're doing their business and reproducing and casting out their spores before the leaf dies. They're not feasting on the dead tissue. Okay, so we call it 
a biotroph instead of a necrotroph. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of biotrophs out there, not nearly as many as saprotrophs, but um, they play an important role, and we'll get a closer look at them because I think they're some of the neatest fungi just because of the important role they play in like all of our agriculture. Like, we, we can't live without them. Okay. Um, but they can also be hyper-diverse in what they live on and live with. This at the bottom here is showing a group of fungi called Malassezia. Malassezia are kind of yeast-like. They're actually dimorphic. Um, they're responsible for dandruff in humans. And they feed on oil. But they're also found at the bottom of those deep ocean vents, feeding on oil um, in those little, like, tube worm things. Okay. So they've made it all the way down to the bottom of the ocean and have found a way to live at hotter than boiling temperatures with sulfuric acid all around um, feeding on oil there and it's in the same genus so these things can be pretty hyper diverse and last but not least we've got necrotrophs right so these are the majority of plant pathogens that people are concerned about aside from rusts okay these kill the plant feast on the dying tissue so economically very damaging here we've got a, this kind of looks like soybean i'm not sure this is arabidopsis the model plant so we're intentionally killing it with necrotrophs um, common tomato diseases right and then these fun ones the zombie fungi that take over insects yeah what what are what's the name of a popular one it's the zombie ants and gets them to like uh, cordyceps is the cordyceps. the main genus. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Thought to be some sort of powerful Chinese medicine. Also, no evidence of that scientifically, but it still means that you pay a lot if you want to buy cordyceps. So, any questions about the the three main groups? Pretty straightforward. We're not diving too deep I have one deep question. Into... Okay. I guess why is it easier to culture the necrotrophs, which is a biotroph, just because you need something live? Yeah. So I mean, how would you grow a rust fungus in a lab? Hmm. Yeah. You'd have to have like a plant. I guess a plant, like a little. Essentially, you you basically need a greenhouse Sweet. to grow them. Um, and you're never going to be able to get them growing by themselves, right? They always have to have that other species there. And so doing molecular work on them means that you've got all the plant DNA kind of mixed in there. It gets really confusing. It's just harder to study um, these biotrophs. Um, necrotrophs are a bit easier because you can give them like dead plant tissue that's been sterilized and they can still kind of go for it. Some of them, some of them actually need the living plant tissue to start working and they just take pleasure in killing I guess um, there are a few little tricks that you can do though if you want to cultivate biotrophs you may not need a whole plant um, I got kind of this crazy idea I saw somebody mention this and it seems to work you pull that little leaf off right here so I would just like take that leaf off of the tree snip the end of the stem off so it's kind of open and then stick that into the auger that kind of keeps the leaf alive for you know a week or two and you can work on these things in a culture dish that way but you're still dependent on living tissue interesting okay so let's move on a little bit and talk just kind of about fungal development. Um, how is it that there can be nothing on a patch of grass and then it rains overnight and in the morning there's six inch tall mushrooms? Any thoughts? 
it's because like the rain was a, a cue to start I don't know germination for something for seed. Well, or... well, not germination. Germination, I think, it would imply like the spore. Oh, I guess it's the fruiting body we see, right? Yeah, fruiting body. The fungus is already like there; it's just underground. It's still a lot of growth. That for... is a lot of growth. Um, we're talking right. like, you know, six inches in a couple hours. Sorry. What was that? Do they like store up energy materials until the moment so that they can put all of their energy into that growth? Sort of. Sort sort of. Yeah, they they definitely set themselves up ahead of time. They're like pre ready. They're they're ready to go, coiled like a spring. But still, how do you get that kind of like growth that fast if you're arm grew that fast right it would rip itself in half i don't know if this is the case but i'm guessing it has to do maybe with some of the moisture levels and being able to maybe move resources really quickly throughout the mycelium so as a kid did you ever have one of those sometimes they're like they're popular around easter time it's like a little pill and you drop it in water and it puffs up into like a dinosaur yeah those are awesome they're awesome. That's what's happening here. Um, they're like super dense. Yeah, it's it's a sponge. It is a dinosaur, like a sponge shaped like a dinosaur. It's just been compacted down into a little pill form. That's what this image is basically showing us. All the cells for the grown mushroom are actually already in place before it starts growing. It's just they're really tiny and condensed and water is that key and so they just swell up okay they don't have to go through a bunch of mitosis it's already been done mitosis is a somewhat slow process right it can take 10 20 minutes to do a round of mitosis um in some cases um so could we say that that they're like 85 90 percent water uh, I, think, up, I think I think like 90, 92 to 95 percent water is is mushroom by mass. Yeah. Oh, okay. Mhm. Mm and you can see this just weigh one of the mushrooms that you find, and then dry it completely, and then weigh it again, and you'll see it weighs about six to eight percent of what it did when you fresh picked it. Okay. Um. So this is really kind of interesting. The, the idea that they've already done the vast majority of their cell division before the mushroom starts growing. They've got like a little baby cap ready to go in there. It's just kind of hard to see in this stage. It's so compressed. You can see that it's already formed there and all the cells are just kind of swelling up. Okay. Um, keep in mind also that this is a different sort of multicellularity than animals have. That's what our reading is actually about, our paper this week, is the origins of fungal multicellularity and how, it, how different it is from animal stuff. Um, they don't have separate unit organs like, like animal tissues in any sense. Um, they're just differentiated appendages of the, the same mycelium. Okay. It's, it's hyphae all the way down here. So this is showing the makeup of a fruit body. It's hyper compressed hyphae, just ready to swell up with water, essentially. So here's a nice little gif. Anyone recognize these mushrooms? They're popular gourmet edible shiitake so these are shiitake mushrooms um they grow somewhat slow compared to other mushrooms but it's still really fast this is showing kind of the hydraulic cell inflation process these things were already formed in their little pinhead essentially just ready to swell up to full size with water um 
who did this? Do they study? just like stop growing after that then, or can they continue to grow? Well, they can grow up to a certain point, and then they're kind of like flush with water. Once the cells are expanded as much as they can, then they're done growing. I got a question on that too. So, is there fruiting body that just spontaneously, or I don't know if it's programmed somehow, like every so often to happen along, like as the hyphae are growing? Like what what decides where a fruiting body is going to exist? Oh, it's it's all those environmental gradients. Okay. So for basidiomycetes, it's got to be dikaryotic. So it's, it's accomplished dikaryotic state. And then it's got to have accumulated enough nutrients. So it's, it's mycelium is big enough that it can actually have the resources to make this. Once it's big enough and it's dikaryotic, then it's capable of forming a mushroom fruit body. Then the environmental cues can take Cold. So whether that's a drop in temperature, increase of moisture, and drop in CO2 concentration, which is kind of the, the trifecta, um, that's where it happens. So kind of where the hypha is poking through the substrate. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so when I grow mushrooms at home, um, I take like one of those just five gallon buckets, a little Home Depot bucket, and I fill it with pasteurized straw and a bunch of mycelium. Just kind of mix it all together, stick it in there, put the lid on. And there are little holes drilled in the side of that bucket. That's where the mushroom is formed because that's where the CO2 is lowest. And so it's just in that environmental cue. Okay. Um, this dude, Buller, back in the 20s and 30s was kind of one of the world's most famous mycologists, and he did a lot of like really crazy, cool experimentation. Um, this is showing one of his experimental setups where he was trying to see how much force um, this Caprinus mushroom could exert. This Caprinus is the same genus, by the way, that turns itself into liquid and ran all over your paper. Okay. Um, because it had been known that these things can like move paving stones growing up. Okay. So I think it held 200 grams, da, 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 da. total weight of 150, through a further millimeter in two hours after the addition of further 50 grams of weight. Okay, so yeah, this thing was still pushing like a, a simple, fragile, soft little mushroom was able to push up 200 grams of mass without even crumpling its stem. Okay. This is all due to that cell inflation and hydraulics. It's the same way a hydraulic lift can lift a car, right? Um, we get incredible amount of force over pretty swift time period. So that's how fairy rings can pop up overnight, is that they were already fully formed, just not inflated. Okay. Another thing Buller was famous for we actually called this Buller's drop because of him, was figuring out the dispersal mechanism for basidiomycetes. Right, so here you've got on top a single spore sitting on a glass slide, and then they put a little Buller droplet right here. You can see it in ultra stop motion, um, or I guess high speed camera is, is the actual what's happening here. That bowler droplet, when it touches, it shifts the weight and launches that thing. Okay. So this is active dispersal in a basidiomycete. Here is active dispersal in what kind of fungus? Colobolus is the genus name. What's the phylum? I thought it's a basidiomycete, isn't it? Uh, top one is. What about this bottom GIF here? Those are the Back ones that grow on dung, right? It's grown on dung. The genus name is Pilobolus. Oh, it's a zygo. Yeah, it's a zygo, the hat thrower. Okay. And then what is this one here on the right? That's ascomycete. That's ascomycete. Ascus. Yeah. 
So Ascomycetes also kind of worked with the fungi are commonly doing this sort of like air pressure and water pressure kind of stuff, right? Um, that's how they exert influence, physical influence over their environment. Same thing's happening here. We've got pressure build up and then the top weakens so everything shoots out. Okay. So that's a little bit about what mushrooms do. Um, why they can pop up so quickly after rain um, and how they get their spores out really fast because a mushroom lifespan might not be that long. It might, in the case of Caprinus, it might be like six to eight hours before it digests itself and is done. Um, so now is the time probably to go finding your mushrooms if you haven't already. Um, right after a rain the next day is a great time to go looking you're definitely going to find like those weird tree ears hanging out on logs some of the jellies that kind of thing All right. so real quick and i don't want to get too deep into this in the sense that i don't need you memorizing this stuff okay um but be familiar with the the idea that in a guidebook it may not say cap it may say pileus and it may not say stem, it may say stipe. It may not say ring, it may say partial veil remnant or annulus. Okay. And the most annoying one of all is instead of gills, some of them say lamella or lamelli for plural. Okay. Why do we have different terms for these things? Um comes from probably when we studied them as plants instead of as fungus? No, this is actually just to be annoying. Oh, okay. Well. Yeah, um, it's to make mycologists feel really important because stem, that's too much like a normal word that people would understand, so we better call it stipe, right? And cap, mushroom cap, everyone knows what that means. So a basidiomycete pileus, sounds way cooler right. but just be aware that some guidebooks may use kind of the fancy terms for it more precise terms okay so these are kind of taken from your little guidebook sheet that i provided um just showing you there is a lot of jargon here okay so you look at the mushroom cap at its shape, at its surface, you look at the gills, whether they're free, meaning they don't attach to the stipe at all, or whether they do attach to the stipe. It's actually a pretty good characteristic to look at fungi. Okay. The Audubon Field Guide to North American Mushrooms, it's the book that got me started on mushroom collecting very quickly breaks mushrooms up into whether the gills are free or attached. Okay. And then if it's attached, you can look at how attached is it, right? Does it start running down the stipe also, or does it kind of just barely make it in? Okay. So there's some names for that. Okay. And then another thing that that book does is say, okay, well, the gills free or attached. Great. Now the veil, is there a veil present? Okay. If so, what does it look like? Is it this cobwebby stuff or is it just remnants around the little stalk there? Okay. So these are actually pretty decent characteristics to get you a basic idea, at least of like mushroom family. Um, getting to species is probably impossible without like looking at the spores under a microscope, but Getting to family or even genus is readily possible if you follow this guide here. Okay. Just a real so, quick question for you. Yeah. If you go back to that other slide, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, which one would the death cap a mushroom fall under for the veil? For the veil, it's it's yeah. got It's got a full annulus, so its veil was actually because the entire mushroom was like enveloped in an egg, essentially, when it's young. 
So it starts out looking kind of like an egg that splits open and then the mushroom comes off. And so it actually has two little veils. It's got this down here, this vulva, so like a remnant cup, like so, and then a flaring one at the top. So it's like it was just ripped in half, but just stayed yes. there? Yes. Um, okay. Since this is an important one to, to know to avoid, Veil. I can spell. Okay. Oh, there's a perfect picture. This looks like a Caesar's mushroom. Okay. But you can see it starts out in this like little egg shape. All right. Hmm. It's fully like enveloped in that egg. And so sometimes this does happen to people they think they've got themselves a puffball which is edible in its young form and they grab this slice it up saute it in butter and then die okay um, because they didn't notice that there's a little baby mushroom living in there okay so if you see this avoid it, it starts out as this egg it splits in half and you can see the remnants here's kind of the vulva the bottom of it and here's the remnant top, that kind of like flaring veil around the, the top. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Zahn? Yeah. And the, for death cap, are the gills always white or can they be other colors? For death cap, they're always white. The family Amanita, or the genus Amanita, is not always white. So this one here, uh, I believe, looks like Amanita cesarium to me, it's Caesar's mushroom, which is. I hesitate to say, but somewhat edible. People have eaten it and not died, um, but it's orange. Okay. Um, not all Amanita have white gills. The death cap does have white gills. Okay, thanks. If you see a mushroom in this characteristic shape, has a ring around it, has a vulva base at the bottom, just forget it. Stay away from it. Don't let your dog go chewing on it or anything like that. Okay. Largely, this is the hey. only one that's like out there killing people. Uh, most other mushrooms, maybe people have allergic reaction and die, but mostly they'll just make you really sick. This whole genus is just bad news bears. There was a question. Sorry. Yeah, Dr. Zong, you know how um, with a lot of species, uh, I'm forgetting the word in ecology, but you know, with like a lot of like little tree frogs and stuff that are orange and red to signal. Oh, like, like a really venomous. malarian mimicry kind of thing? Exactly, exactly. Is there anything um, like that to do with fungus or they just kind of pick whatever color they want and they and everyone knows just to stay away? Well, it kind of depends because some things can eat these and it's fine. And in fact, some insects eat them and it helps spread their spores. Um, I'm not exactly certain what the like ecological function of their amatoxin class proteins are, but they just happen to kill animals. I guess maybe they don't want to be eaten by deer or whatever. But reindeer do eat these fly agaric, the red and white spotted ones, quite regularly and get high um they are hallucinogenic so reindeer in sweden norway will seek these things out and like gorge themselves on them and then sit around in a stoned stupor enjoying their life so it obviously doesn't kill everything okay. um i don't know that malarian mimicry it's certainly not something I've heard of in mycology. I don't want to say it doesn't exist. Um, so many mushrooms look so similar to each other, though. It's just like little brown mushroom, right? Some of those are the most poisonous out there. Um, like the magic mushroom that humans eat for fun um, or for religious reasons, right? The Those... It's basically just like a little brown mushroom 
um, they don't make that chemical in order to help humans have uh, numinous experiences. They do it to keep insects from eating them. It's like a weird little insect mind control thing. Um, but they don't look like they're poisonous to insects. Um, so that's a good question. I certainly haven't heard of it. All right, so I did give you an example um, where I filled out the, uh, the sheet with, you know, 1A through G and then 2A through G. And I did it for the uh, Amanita muscaria, that fly agaric mushroom. Did everyone find that? Did anyone find it? Yeah, I saw it. Okay. It's on the website, um, and I think I stuck it up on Teams as well. So you have an example of kind of what I'm looking for. Now, you may be wondering, how do I tell the difference between a canapulate and a parabolic uh, mushroom pileus? Well, let's see here. One looks like that. One looks like that. Easy, right? No. Good luck. Well, until you actually have something in front of you, and then you're like, well, just how curved is it? Exactly. No, it, I think it's it, it can be a hopeless endeavor. There's um, definitely a margin of objectivity, or subjectivity, rather, that, that goes into this. Like, how curved is it? Yeah. You just have to make a call at some point. Um, or for attachment of gills, 103 versus 105. So physically, we just make the best guess? Yes, your best okay. guess. <laughs> yeah, okay. attachment of gills, adnate versus adnext. That really gets into like how free they are when you gently rub the tip of your thumb next to the stipe and see how wavy they get. Isn't this stupid? I hate it. Um, and even that, it's up for like interpretation. Okay, so you just get as close as you can. Um, make your best effort. Um, that's what I did for the fly agaric mushroom. Okay, because I don't remember all of these characters for fly agarics. I've picked hundreds of them in my day. I think they're beautiful. Uh, but I don't remember all this stuff, and so I was just looking at pictures and doing my best guess. Okay. What this gets you to do is to look at the mushroom more closely and look at all these different characters and kind of think about it. How long do the mushrooms last? I know that's kind of a stupid question, but you know what I mean? Like, so like how soon after I picked it, should I start looking at the gills and stuff before it dries out and I- That I'm day. Probably... Okay. Yeah. All right, so I gotta do it today. <laughs> Okay. Mm -hmm. It's a that day situation. You might get a few days tops if you keep okay. them in a paper bag in your fridge. I, okay. Uh, I did but they it. will start to dry out really fast. Okay. Great. I'm glad I asked. Um, if you don't have Amanita mushrooms, you can go ahead and dry these in like a regular food dehydrator or in your oven on like 120 degrees or whatever if you want like to preserve a nice little dried specimen. And those are good for years afterwards if you just want to have a little collection. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This is what you want us to use to identify all the mushrooms that we gather? Those five mushrooms, right? Not necessarily identify, but to characterize. To characterize, sorry. Yeah. Yes. Okay. You might be able to get to genus on, on these fungi, on the, the basidio carps that you, you find. Um, for some really recognizable ones, like if you found the fly agaric, that one's nothing else is red with white blotches and has that universal veil. Um, so maybe you could get to species on some of them, but you may notice that I'm not giving you like a mushroom guidebook. Okay, if you want one, let me know and I'll send a link. Um, but I think it's better to just be looking at 
the fungi observing them rather than have that end goal of I must get an identification. Okay. And part of that is because the guidebooks just are crap, right? So here's a guidebook description for this fungus seen here. Okay. Felidon confluence. This is a pretty common fungus um, found in alpine zones near water um, up into the Canadian Rockies even. Um, so margin, usually white, becoming gray to dark brown when bruised. Flesh of a two of cap two layered with soft cottony upper layer colored like the surface and a firm dark two zoned lower layer. Odor disagreeable. Taste mild to disagreeable. All right, what do you go on with this? From this description, which one of these are you picking? They're all the same exact species. None, because the taste is disagreeable. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, uh, so the top one looks tastiest, so. I actually like the smell of these. I, I think it's an interesting smell. Um, I've never had the wherewithal to taste them, but this is what the spores look like. That's probably your best tool in identifying these because the color certainly isn't very much use to you. It depends on what it's growing on, um, what time of year, and how old the basidio carp is. Okay. Um, the texture might not even be useful. So this one here, it's going to actually be weeping little like bits of fluid, kind of like a yellowish fluid if it's cut. By the time it's this old, it doesn't do that, and it's all woody, okay? So I don't think that guidebook descriptions and keys are the best way to go identifying mushrooms unless you're like an expert in that group um, with years of experience, okay? Um, this one it says color varies greatly with moisture changes. Okay, so that basically means throw out all of the above information because it doesn't even tell you which one of these is moist, which one is dry. Okay, this is why I'm not focusing on you identifying your mushrooms so much as observing them and just kind of getting to know the different parts of a mushroom. This will make it easier for you if you do want to take up like mushroom hunting as a hobby to know the sorts of the components of a mushroom and what to look at. Any questions? That's as deep as I felt like going into um, mushroom physiology or identification. Um, for this, it's just an intro class, right? Um, so, so my apologies. Gonna, if you wanted more, like if you wanted me to make you key out a bunch of species, but I'm not going to do that. Are we going to get marked off points if uh, we get them wrong? Like you were like, oh, I know what that is. That's that's supposed to have free attachment of gills, and he put adenate. No. No, I want you to do your best. It'll be okay. fine. Yeah. Hey, Dr. Zahn. Mm -hmm. Can can I ask a question about the test uh, in a very, like, I just said about the question, ask what the question means, not about the answer. Sure. Um, so on the, on the very last question, um, you asked us to, like, uh, fill out one of those slides that we always see at the end of the lectures. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so the slide, so I, I pulled up one of those slides to make sure that I had like each of the points so that I remember to, to touch them all as I go through it. And so the slide, I believe, had like evolution as one of the categories. I think it had life cycle, evolution, morphology, physiology, and diversity, mm -hmm. or something like that. But then in the, in the question, it said, let me see, what did you say? You said, tell about life cycle, physiology, phylogenetic placement, et cetera. But phylogenetic placement wasn't on the slide, so are we supposed well, to say everything evolution. on the slide plus that? Oh, okay. Evolution gets at that phylogenetic placement when you think. Okay, I, I, I probably just wasn't thinking it enough through. I just saw the ones up there, then 
then saw the ones you added and I thought they were a little bit different. But yeah, it is basically the same thing. If you think yeah, about. yeah. So use use this slide as kind of the template, right? That's um, what I was going to do. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Let me check the chat box here. I have another question about the, I guess it's about the exam where you say insert a picture like any picture or do you want to find like take a picture? Oh no, just just like just this. Picture, find a picture. Yeah, okay. Google, Google photo search. Google is fine. Okay, that's what I was going to ask. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Oh, we can't just take a picture of the mushrooms we're picking? You can if you want. Yeah. Yep. Um, I'm, I'm just giving this as an option if you don't want to, you know, be taking pictures of yourself or your family. All right, your reading assignment. Where are we, week five? Kiss et al. Comparative genomics reveals the origin of fungal hyphae and multicellularity. All right. Uh, this will be our last like real physiology look at mycology, but I'll put the quiz up by this evening. And you should be ready to go. So the quiz isn't on more chapters. It's just this uh, mm -hmm. article. OK. Yeah, and if you look through um, kind of the the remainder, we the reading assignments are all Oh, did I? I've got one more chapter, Webster and Weber 22. Huh. I may take that off. I'm kind of hoping to just be reading papers for the, the rest of the semester. The, the textbook's really good at talking about fungi that we know about, but it's not going to be our best source for, you know, current cutting edge information about the origin of fungal hyphae, right? That's that's from KISS at all. This paper came out late last year. And so this is brand new stuff. So that's I kind of like to focus on that. So give you experience reading scientific articles. We've pretty much then gone over most of like the the big groups of fungi in our readings. Totally. Then. Yeah, we have. So we're we're moving on now to kind of like looking at specific things that fungi do. Okay. okay. So that's the next section of this class. Um, so we just took a look at mushroom mechanics. Okay, kind of to wrap up our basidiomyces stuff. Then it's medical mycology, plant pathogens population ecology, and then we move into symbioses, okay? And then we wrap up with ethnomycology, so we'll talk all about how people have been using mushrooms for the past thousands of years and how they're currently um, being used in industry and such. And then molecular, like the bioinformatics side of things, uh, just a real brief, how do you take a DNA sequence from a mushroom and get a species ID? I'm going to teach you how to do that, and then Course is over. And we can all have a nice winter break. So about that, uh, I got an email today. Are they going to shut the school down again? Yeah, probably. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Yep. Uh, I, I think we can blame the BYU kids, right, for spiking the ca uh, cases in this county. I UVU so, has actually been pretty good. Everything's always the BYU kids' fault. That's that's just the rule at UVU. Okay. All right. Well, if nothing else, it looks like some of you are staying on to work on stuff. So I'm just going to stop the recording. I won't end the call if you want to stay on here.